Okay, good morning. Um, so my name is Jochen Berelsten. In, in fact, I'm replacing here Professor Jose Moreno. He was supposed to give a talk here. Jose Moreno, he is the uh, PI of the FLEX mission. I guess he was supposed to talk about all this as so. Um, but since this is not really my main focus, um, I decided today not to talk about FLEX, but if there are people interested in, in the FLEX and Explore mission, uh, we can talk more about it tomorrow. In fact, my Speciality is about uh, vegetation properties mapping, and these days I would like to talk about how to automate vegetation properties mapping, how to optimize, and how to simplify it. Now let's have a look to the Earth, living planets that provide food and feed to all of us. And the question here is, so how do we quantify vegetation properties? And I would like to see this from the point of view of uh, optical remote sensing. So these friends here, these two guys here, Sentinel trees, and this is Flex. However, um, I guess you all are familiar already with Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, so I will not really talk about these satellite missions. I would rather like to talk about methods. Methods, so how to quantify vegetation properties. So um, when we um, um, look to um, the Earth from an optical remote sensing point of view, basically what we have, we have um, solar radiation that interacts with vegetation. Uh, it absorbs. Um, there is scattering, and at the end it reflects towards the sensor, right? So the variation that we observe here, we assume, is due to variation on our Earth, on our vegetation. Now, our vegetation we can quantify in all kinds of ways, and all these ways they may have influence on our reflected radiation. So the idea is that from our reflected radiation we can go backwards towards vegetation properties. What are vegetation properties that can be either leaf pigments such as chlorophyll content, dry matter, water content, but also can be structural effects eh, such as um, um, biomass, vegetation density, um, um, height, leaf area indexed, and so on. And even uh, nowadays they also can be um, biochemistry eh, such as the photosynthesis. Um, so the idea is that uh, we will try to do this whole cycle, uh, to do the calculation from um, reflected radiation backwards to our vegetation properties so that we can quantify them. Now, why do we want to quantify them? In order to get more idea about our changing Earth. So uh, vegetation properties, they are used in all kinds of uh, global vegetation models. And these can be um, um, quantified either at a local scale or a global scale. The scale doesn't really matter. At the end, um, it's always about more or less the same properties. So chl chlorophyll content, leaf area index, um, height, biomass. But most important to realize is that an optical sensor never measured these properties, right? It just measured reflected radiation. So always a model is required how to translate reflected radiation into a quantifiable vegetation property, okay? So what do we have? On one hand, we have our spectral data from the Sentinels, from FLEX, and so on. Typically, we also have field data for training, for validations, and so on. And this all we try to put together into a model so um, it always occurs through a model, and there are um, two classical ways how these models can be treated. On one hand, classically, we have the um, statistical approaches. Uh, you can think about simply regression. Maybe you can calculate uh, NDVI, and this you try to correlate with leaf area index or so on. Or on the other hand, we have more physical-based approaches, which are the so-called relative transfer models. I call them RTMs. In RTMs, they try to uh, mimic the interactions between light and, and vegetation. So that's more the physical approach. But essentially, so we always need a model. And um, basically, we can break down these two big categories into more subcategories. Um, and my talk will be today more that we try to go through them all. And I would like to show you all kind of um, methods how to quantify vegetation properties. So on one hand, we have these um, statistical models. Uh, these we can divide into either parametric regression models, think about NDVI and we apply a regression function, or uh, non-parametric regression models. And these again, we can divide into either linear methods, so they do linear transformations, or non-linear methods. And those guys here, they became extremely uh, popular for the last few years. You can think of machine learning methods, okay? On the other hand, there are also the uh, so-called physical way how we um, deal with um, um, optical data. And typically, so we make use of uh, these uh, RTMs, these relative transfer models, that we try to do a so-called inversion of these models against our optical data so that we calculate back in a physical way towards our inputs, which are chlorophyll, LAI, and so on. Also here, there are two uh, popular approaches. On one hand is the uh, numerical optimization. So basically, you try to 
run your um, satellite data against an RTM until finally it finds an optimum and then calculates um, the LAI, chlorophyll, or so on. But this is uh, quite time consuming, so much more popular are the so-called lookup table based methods. So basically you first uh, generate a large amount of simulations and you use those to do the inversion. Okay, so um, a little bit um, taxonomy. Um, so we have on one hand um, statistical methods. So the parametric methods, they always make use of some, but not too much, physical knowledge. Think about NDVI. We all know why we use NDVI, because of the absorbance in the red, which is due to uh, the amount of vegetation or amount of chlorophyll content. So there is some physical knowledge in parametric regression methods included, but not too much, because at the end, with the NDVI, we don't quantify any vegetation property, right? We just have an, an index. So still, then afterwards, some statistics is needed, eh? a correlation, a regression function, how to uh, translate NDVI towards NDVI or chlorophyll, towards LAI or chlorophyll content, okay? On the other hand, we have these uh, so-called non-parametric regression methods, and these are purely data-driven methods. So the results of these uh, methods, they depend on what you feed it, what is the input. Hey, you put in some data into a machine learning method, a neural network or so, um, it trains it based on that data and it performs according to that data, right? So it's very powerful, but at the end, it's only as good as the input data. So on the other hand, we have these uh, physical methods and they um, rather try to understand um, the, our reflectance through uh, physical laws, so how scattering absorption occurs. And these um, um, uh, RTEDs by means of right transfer methods which make um, which are more deterministic according to cause effect relationships so they always behave the same and they behave according to physical um, equations finally and maybe most popular when we move towards uh, operational methods so um, so let's say uh, when we want to develop methods that are globally applicable um, is to make use to combine both uh, statistical methods with physical methods and these are what we call the hybrid methods so hybrid methods they make use of the um, generality of physical models, but also they combine it with the flexibility of uh, non-parametric methods, typically machine learning methods, um, in order to develop um, a generic models. So uh, for instance, you can think of that you train a neural network with simulations coming from an RTM. That's the most common way to map LEI, chlorophyll, and so on. So, so here this gives us an overview of these uh, methods. So we have the uh, statistical methods. You can think of NDVI with a, a linear fit. Uh, non-parametric methods, you can think of neural networks, and then the inversion of um, RTMs, and finally the hybrid methods. So now let's have a look a bit um, more into detail of each of these family of methods. So still the uh, largest um, type of methods that are being, using, being used in optical remote sensing are the simple statistical relationships. Think about vegetation indices, NDVI, PRI, there are hundreds of them and they continue to, to be um, um, developed and exploited. So these kind of methods, they, um, they say that there is some relationship, but they don't really say why there is a relationship. It's just a fitting function after all. So they are often used as uh, useful indicators for these physical variables. But however, they are also often confounded by other factors. So for instance, when you develop um, a method based on a vegetation index, such as NDVI for LEI, and maybe it does very good LEI mapping, but what happens if your surface is not consisting of vegetation, but also there is soil or there is influence of topography? So your method is becoming confounded because it's not really taking that into account in your, in your regression function. So that's the main problem of these kind of methods is that they may work very well on a local scale or on a scale where it has been parameterized and validated, but they work poor, poorly when you move it to other situation. So with, what we can say is that these kind of methods, they lack generality. Um, this was maybe very true until um, recently, but I would say increasingly this kind of statistical relationships are being replaced by these so-called machine learning methods. And I think nowadays people are not really using NDVIs or so anymore, but they immediately they train their data into a machine learning method. Okay, so some examples of uh, vegetation indices, we can think of uh, two-band indices so as a simple ratio, NDVI, PRI, and so on. Very simple equations. Um, and they are, so they are based on some physical interpretation of our signal. Um, in the past, it was fashioned to develop three-band indices, four-band indices. But essentially, especially when you're having hyperspectral data, it always um, under-exploits the full 
information what is embedded in the, spe in the spectral signal, right? When you have 100 bands available, why would you restrict yourself to two, three, four bands, okay? So uh, in case of uh, having uh, many bands available, uh, more and more what we see are so-called uh, shape indices. So they not really just take a few bands, but they rather they try to make use of the spectral shape of the signal. And here you can think about um, red edge um, position indices. So they search for where exactly is red edge by means of derivative or interpolation or so on. So in the red edge, uh, it, that's, um, that's something that changes depending on the um, amount of vegetation or so. Or you can think of uh, derivative indices or um, um, integral indices. So these kind of indices already, they make use of more spectral information than just a few bands. Um, may, maybe even more advanced are the so-called continuum removal. So where, where you take the, the, the shape, um, you, you remove the total shape so that you only have the absorption functions. Or wavelets, so where you analyze your signal uh, through a few wavelengths so that specific information can be extracted out of your signal. So all these um, uh, so-called um, uh, shape-based indices are more used into the uh, hyperspectral domain of optical remote sensing. But still, once you apply this, you still need a regression function to link it towards your vegetation property of interest, LAI, chlorophyll. So st at the end, you, you still stay typically with a linear regression or, or another simple one. So, and this brings me maybe a little bit to the strengths and weaknesses of uh, these kind of methods. Um, on the one hand, um, Parametric regression methods they are very simple. Everybody can calculate the NDVI and then they're doing a, a simple uh, linear fit. They are very fast. That's maybe the main advantage. And so also therefore computationally inexpensive. However, they have many, many weaknesses, I would say so. Um, first of all, they actually make very poorly use of the available information, especially when you use only a two band index, what to do with all the information in the other bands. Um, so therefore they tend to be more noise uh, sensitive as compared to field spectrum methods. And uh, typically, um, so they um, are only applicable for a certain situation, right? So they are um, only in one point in space and time, but they are poorly portable towards other um, environments or so. And maybe the, uh, in my point of view, the most important weakness of parametric regression methods is that they do not calculate uncertainty estimates. So you always have an estimate, but you never have uncertainty about it. More advanced methods, as we will see later on, they also are able to calculate uncertainties. Anyway, so when we want to apply it, it's very simple. And so here is a little bit uh, cookbook how to, to use it. So you have your satellite data, you apply a vegetation index, you have some calibration data that you measured in the field. And with this, you um, calibrate your regression function, part of the data or other data you use for validation. You have your methods and afterwards you apply it to, to your image and that's it. So only two, three steps and you can, steps and you can make your, your maps. Okay, so now let's move towards the uh, uh, non-parametric regression methods. And here I want to show first uh, the methods that does uh, linear, um, linear methods. They do linear transformations and maybe the most popular method you can think of is uh, PCA. Uh, it does a uh, principal component analysis. It does a linear transformation to compress the data, the variability of the data in a few components. And then afterwards, P, uh, principal component regression simply applies a linear regression. A little bit more advanced are the uh, partial least square regression, where you, it does the same as a PCA, but it takes also the relationship with the variable of interest into account. But essentially, it's, it's like an advanced PCA, so to say. Um, other popular methods are rich regression and lasso, and these are also um, regression methods where they um, constrain the coefficients um, in case of there are multiple solutions, so it constrains it so that a, a proper solution is being um, found. And both of them, they apply a, a penalty region to how to constrain, and they differ slightly, but again, it's the same method. Well, the most important to realize is that these kind of methods, they apply linear transformations. So it's very simple math still at the end and very fast, but um, you can imagine already there exist more powerful methods. So because when we move towards um, nonlinear methods, and these methods, they apply nonlinear transformations. And now it becomes maybe more interesting because these are really the methods of the last few years. So we have the decision trees, such as random forest is very popular nowadays, support vector regression, Gaussian processes regression, which is um, those are nonlinear transformations in a Bayesian way. So you also have uh, uncertainties calculated with it. Neural networks, we all know now we have this deep learning where actually it's the same as neural networks, but with not a few hidden layers, but many, many hidden layers. 
kernel rich regression um, is more or less the same as this Gaussian process regression. So kernels are um, nonlinear transformations in the hyperdimension uh, parametric space. So they train uh, well, they are very powerful, but um, with many, many data, um, they become very um, dense and takes long time to train. Again, the uh, strengths and weaknesses um, of these kind of methods, um, in my opinion, they have much more strengths, especially because these, these kind of methods, most important, they make, can make use of all the spectral data available. So contrary to a vegetation index, you can just feed in all the spectral data. It develops a method. They are adaptive, they are advanced, they are nonlinear, and they can be very accurate and robust. Um, so some of them, they are very powerful to deal with noise, um, depending on the tuning of these methods, so you can make them more sensitive or less sensitive to noise. Um, so the most important is that once it has been trained, it can be applied to any kind of image and it goes super fast. So some of them also, they are able to deal with large amount of training data, especially neural networks. So that's why neural networks are typically used in operational settings because they've been trained by 100,000 or millions of cases. It takes some training time, but once it's trained, you have your model, it can be applied all over the world. Um, so some of them, as I said, they also give uh, insights in um, model development. So it tells you what are the important bands uh, when during the model development, especially uh, Gaussian processes, uh, decision trees are able to show you where are the inf relevant information within the spectral data. Some of them, they also provide multi-output so that not only one variable at one time is estimated, but multiple variables. So you can develop a model, model that immediately estimates LEI, chlorophyll content, biomass, and so on. And some of them, I think this is the most important, they provide uncertainties. So you know about the performance of your model. Weaknesses, um, well, the training can take a long time, but nowadays we all have powerful computers, so I don't think this is an issue anymore. Um, so maybe the main problem is that they, um, um, there's a problem of so-called um, overtraining. So you can develop extremely specialized models that work extremely well on your data, but when you apply to another type of data, it tends to perform poorly. So you need some methods how to deal with that. For instance, you apply cross-validation methods, so you train several models to see how robust they are, and then you take the most robust one. Um, so maybe um, in the past, the main problem of these kind of methods is that they, they are perceived as complex. It's not that you just can calculate this on, on, your, on the blackboard or so. But I think nowadays also this is no longer an issue because we have uh, packages in all kinds of languages, in R, in Python, and so on, that you can just take them off the shell and apply them. So I would say so. Um, it's not that it's, uh, they are uh, user unfriendly. I would say rather they are user friendly. Nowadays, it's just a package and you let it run and that's it. Um, so maybe another main weakness is that they are considered as black boxes, and especially neural networks. You don't really know what is happening inside. A model is trained and it works well, but what happened inside? But also here, again, some methods, they are able to give you some relevant information about what are the bands being used in the model and so on. So at least some methods are what we call gray boxes. And... Um, Okay, uh, so some are maybe maybe not too stable, but at the end it all depends on the training data, right? So the more um, of better quality your training data, of better quality your model. So when applying these kind of methods, actually it's even simpler than parametric regression methods because no longer there is a need to select specific bands or a specific equation, an index or so on. Basically, you can just feed um, your complete spectral data into the model and then apply it. So again, you uh, train it, you validate it. If you're happy with the validation, you apply it to the image and you have your map. So I would say it's even simpler than parametric regression model. However, uh, it's also true that if there are too many bands included, there's this problem of um, redundancy, band redundancy. So then maybe it's advisable that you um, do a selection or even better, you just automatically apply a dimensionality reduction. So for instance, you first apply your PCA and then afterwards you apply your machine learning method. Okay, so now let's move towards the uh, more uh, physical um, way of dealing with optical data. And here what we have to uh, first define are the so-called uh, state variables. So what are state variables? Those are the variables that have a direct impact on reflected radiation. So when you, basically it's when you change your state variable, it will change your reflectance. You can think about chlorophyll content eh, when it's more green, we see it's greener, so our reflectance is changing, it's more absorbance, it goes down. When there's more LAI, also um, more absorbance, so your reflectance is going down. So state variables are variables that 
um, influence or that make vary our reflectance, reflectance data. What are not state variables? For instance, nitrogen. Nitrogen eh, is a part of chlorophyll content, so in this way, I would say it's more um, indirect variable or variable of interest. Um, since uh, nitrogen is directly related with chlorophyll content, um, we can are able to map nitrogen, but we should be well aware it's because of the chlorophyll content, right? So they are the state variables where there's an explicit relationship, and then there are variables where there are some relationships, but we can make them um, indirect relationships and also make models towards these kind of variables. Now, state variables, those are the variables that are into derivative transfer models. Derivative transfer models are a function of variables that have a direct influence on our reflectance, transmittance, or fluorescence. And when we uh, divide um, or categorize our derivative transfer models, we can think of what we call economically invertible models. And these are models that are very fast um, and with little variables, and they are very useful when you want to do model inversion, for instance, for mapping applications. However, they are also very simple because of just a few variables. You can think of SAIL later, we will, we will see some examples. On the other hand, we have what we call the um, non-economical invertible models, and these are very advanced complex models that are very well able to simulate our, our planet, our Earth, our landscape, our fields, but it requires so many variables that you can do some simulations, but it's not practical in an operational setting when you want to do inversion of these models against an image. So, so here we can have our overview um, figure again. So now our biophysical variables, actually, we can um, use them in, into our relative transfer model. So basically, our RTMs is a function of state variables of measurable um, biophysical parameters that have direct impact on our reflectance. Chlorophyll, LAI, water content, leaf angle distribution, so on. Why are RTMs so important? Because once we have an RTM, we can do all kinds of simulations as a satellite would observe, okay? So we can use this for development of new indices, for instance, or evaluation of indices. We can use this for mapping, and we can do inversion, or we can train machine learning models with our simulated data from these RTMs, or we can use it to design whole new missions. So um, I'm involved into the FLEX mission, and we all make use of very advanced RTMs so that we are able to simulate exactly the same as what FLEX will simulate. We um, simulate biochemistry, fluorescence, we simulate the properties of the leaf, of the canopy, and the atmosphere, and in this way we are able to simulate any possible situation the satellite is able to observe. So let's have a closer look to our RTMs. On one hand, um, I want to focus on leaf models, and on the other hand, of canopy models. Leaf models, as you can imagine, you have them in all kinds of shapes and forms, but basically, um, there exist simple ones and uh, complex ones. The simple ones treat a leaf just as a number of layers. So the more layers, the um, less light that passes through, or so to say, the more it absorbs. And, and a leaf would just be a number of layers, and you say, okay, so many layers, and in this way, uh, it defines the absorptions and the transmittance. On the other hand, there exist also complete ray tracing models, so that um, um, these models, they mimic a leaf exactly how it is, so with the um, palisade and, and all the um, uh, cells within the leaf. And, and the same accounts for canopy models. Also, we can treat a canopy model just as a space of leaf elements, two-bit medium, just like this, and the only variable is the density of these leaf elements and maybe also the angle of the leaf elements, but nothing more. Or we can define some shapes and then we can uh, make combinations, so the shapes, it can, we can uh, define the shape of the canopy and then also the spectral properties of the soil. Or eventually we can come up with um, simulating realistic scenes, how a complete tree, a house, or whatever would look like in, by means of 3D um, RTMs. So some few more words about leaf. Uh, it's very important to realize a leaf is not opaque, and uh, you can look through a leaf. Uh, if you, have a leaf in your hand and you point at the sun, you will see that actually a large amount of the leaf passes, a large amount of the light passes through the leaf. It's transparent. And, and that's the essential of the leaf optical models and how it's being put in canopy models. So always we have some reflectance, we have some that is absorbed by the leaf, and we have a part that is transmitted through the leaf. And when it's transmitted through the leaf, it can go to the next leaf. Again, some part is reflected, some is absorbed, and some is transmitted, and so on and so on. And that's how canopy models work, right? They make use of these essential properties of uh, reflectance, absorbance, and um, transmittance. So on one hand, this is this um, layered model. 
So it's just layers, and then uh, the, these layers are defined by chlorophyll content, water content, and dry matter. Or they are these ray tracing models where you can define each single cell of the leaf, okay? Same for canopy models. I think especially from the 90s and the 2000s onwards, lots of progress has been made to make the models each time more realistic, but also more complex. So we can see of our turbid medium models, two layers model with geometric shapes, um, the topography is included, until finally these so-called ray tracing models where realistic forests are simulated exactly the same way how a real forest looked like. Now, um, what are the um, advantages and disadvantages? So these look very real. It's very nice for um, some uh, lab experiments or so on. However, for um, operational use, when you want to make, make use of many, many simulations for all kinds of situations, this one will cause you a nightmare or at least a few years of your life. On the other hand, these ones are very, very fast and generate all kinds of millions of simulations just in, I don't know, minutes or so. So in uh, operational use, for instance, inversion against satellite image, typically these kind of models are being used. Okay, so the most simple model is uh, the SAIL model from the 80s. And uh, as I said before, basically it consists of a stack of, um, an, let's say, an, an, an area where um, there are leaf properties put into it. And these leaf properties, they maybe have a leaf angle and they have a leaf density, and that's all. And then it just, where is the sun? Where is your... Um, um, with your sensor, so, so the geometry takes into account the geometry, and it takes in, with this it calculates thanks to this reflectance, transmittance, ob absorbance. So it takes, it calculates the total reflectance of the whole canopy towards a certain direction. In the 90s and 2000s, uh, some more advanced models have been um, developed so that takes the ge um, geometry into account, so it calculates the cases for. Uh, when there's no background or the cases when there is only, vege um, only vegetation or, or both of them into account. Uh, another popular model is that it divides in uh, multiple layers so for the soil, for the leaf, for the canopy, and even the atmosphere. But the model that we are using nowadays is the uh, scope model because here already a new um, dimension of model is being put into it, and that's the uh, so-called biochemistry uh, models, and I think especially for, for this session here is of importance because they calculate the photosynthesis. And so in this way, we have a link towards the carbon community. Um, so um, basically, uh, uh, fluorescence is being calculated, and at the end, also GPP products are being part. So this is within the leaf, the leaf is within the canopy, the canopy is within the atmosphere. So you basically, you couple all kind of um, RTMs at a different scale in order to calculate the whole energy budget or the um, signal that you observe by satellite. Uh, maybe some words about ray tracing models. So these are typically used in computer graphics, computer games or so. And just like this painting, um, how does it work? So he is, um, he, this guy here, uh, he has a, a maze, a grid, and he makes a figure of the lady. Um, he draws it per, per cell, right? So, so basically he traces the light, how it goes through the cell towards, um, at the end, um, his, his, his is painting. So what does ray tracing models do? They trace all the photons from a source, interaction with the canopy towards a sensor at the end. And um, so they are very powerful for very realistic scenes, but you can imagine it takes long computational time. Um, maybe as a compromise of these ray tracing models are the um, so-called hybrid models. So they, they do ray tracing so that you can make um, 3D scenes, but the scenes itself are rather simplistic because the vegetation is just considered as some um, let's say a geometric envelope, so cones, um, ellipsoids, uh, uh, circles, and so on. So in this way, the processing speed is still rather fast. Okay, so how we use these RTMs into um, image processing? So we have our RTM. Uh, you have some need of some auxiliary data, such as uh, where is the sun, where is the sensor. Maybe you have some data from in the field, so that you know about chlorophyll and so on. You put that into the RTM. And you put in your biophysical variables, your LAI, chlorophyll, and so on, and you have simulations, radiometric data. So this is what we call the uh, forward simulations, okay? But more of interest when we want to apply it for mapping applications is the, um, the backwards. And basically what it does, so um, we have our simulations and we start comparing that against the signal of a pixel. <coughs> so for each pixel, we calculate all possible simulations until we find a perfect match. And with this match, we know, okay, it's that chlorophyll, that LEI. And we put those 
values on the pixel, and we move to the next pixel, and so on and so on, so that at the end, you obtain a map of LEI chlorophyll, and all these variables that are these input variables of the model. However, there is a problem of what we call the um, ill-posed inverse um, problem, which means that many combinations, maybe they may cause of the same kind of reflectance. You can think of a high LEI and a low chlorophyll may cause the same kind of reflectance as a low LEI and high chlorophyll content. So that makes the situation slightly more complex, and it exists all kinds of methods how to deal with, with this um, um, ill post problem. So the, again, the cookbook, um, um, as you can see, this method is already slightly more complicated. So we have our RTM, we have some input data. We generate um, a lookup table, so a large amount of simulations for a specific sun sensor configuration. And then afterwards, we apply a cost function, so a minimization function that does this matching a per pixel against um, um, the signal from the image. Um, again, you apply it against validation data. If you are happy with this whole procedure, you start applying it pixel by pixel, and you do the mapping of your um, input variables. So this is uh, the classical lookup table-based inversion, but maybe more interest is the um, hybrid approach. It's almost the same, but instead of using um, um, a cost function to do this minimization, you just use this lookup table, you put that into a machine learning method. So you use all the simulations that you use for training of your machine learning methods. Once the model is being trained, validated, and you're happy with it, you can apply it to an image, and it goes super fast. So maybe to summarize this, uh, main families of methods. On one hand, parametric regression, where we apply vegetation indices, shape indices, or simple transformations. Then, you add, such as PCA, you apply a fitting function, typically linear regression. You have your map. Non-parametric regression methods, here you can use all bands. But if you have many bands, it's advisable to reduce the dimension, for instance, by means of a PCA. And you apply it into a non-parametric method, typically a machine learning method. And you have your map. Um, RTM inversion, either you develop a lookup table and you apply um, spectral fitting by means of a cost function, or you are able to do numerical inversion, so you do inversion immediately against the model, finally you get your map, or hybrid methods, so where we use our lookup table to put into a, a machine learning method, and you have your map. Uh, as you can see, uh, I did some testings with it, and uh, I used the same input image and as output, I always wanted to uh, derive LAI. You can see they are pretty much the same, but not quite the same. So now the question here is uh, which method is, is, is best performing. And that's the tricky part, right? So um, um, as long as you don't do proper validation or so, you're never sure about your method if it's really the right one. Um, here maybe uh, just to, to close this, um, so I want to give you just some overview of the type of methods, so the family of methods or retrieval methods. So on one hand, we have uh, regression. On the other hand, we have the uh, uh, physical way, RTM-based. Within the regression, we have the parametric and the non-parametric methods. So parametric, you can think of vegetation indices, shape indices, spectral transformations. But at the end, you always end up with a fitting function, mostly linear regression or so. Non-parametric, on one hand, you have these linear transformations, such as partially square regression, uh, uh, principal component regression, or so on or non-linear, which is more interesting. So these are the machine learning methods. You can think of decision trees, all kind of neural networks, kernel-based methods, such as support vector regression, uh, Gaussian process regression. And within the um, RTM-based, so we have two families. On one hand, this lookup table-based. So you first generate your lookup table, your simulations, and then apply uh, spectral fitting with the cost function, or numerical inversion, where you just let for each pixel run your RTM. Okay, so having all these methods, actually this um, does not help us much further because it leads us to many more questions that uh, we started with. So, um, for instance, what would be the right band combination? What would be the right formulation? What would be the right fitting function in case we apply spectral indices? In case we apply more advanced statistical methods, should we go for um, parametric, non-parametric? What would be the training data, the validation data, which method to use? The same for um, more physical methods. Should we use parameterization? What kind of cost function? Um, should we make use of a priori information? There are all kinds of regulation of options. And all this, again, influence depending on what kind of sensor you're using, what kind of data you're using. So um, the more methods we have, actually, the more questions it brings to us. 
And um, this maybe can be problematic, but on the other hand, uh, luckily there exist nowadays many tools that are able to rapidly compare these kind of methods so that you can come up with the best performing one. And here I would like to um, introduce um, um, some software that we developed uh, that enables to automate all these methods. And so today and the next coming days, I would like to discuss a little bit more about uh, these, um, these tools for automated mapping and optimizing and simplifying. So um, it's called um, Artmo. And um, for today, I want just to show you a little bit the basic principles of it. And maybe in the next coming days, we can do some exercises. I can show you how to do automated mapping. So basically, um, uh, it started from, um, well, I started with it since 2010. And basically, the idea was um, um, within the vegetation community, all of us, we are making use of RTMs. But it was always a question, which one is the right RTM? Hey, is it some RTMs are maybe more for um, homogeneous fields, such as agriculture, or are maybe more for forest. Some, ones are, some RTMs are directly available within the lab. Other ones, you have to pay for it. So they always were these questions, which is the proper RTM to use for our application? Also, we should realize an image never consists of one homogeneous um, um, scene or surface. And there's always patches of forest and, and grassland and so on. So basically, you want to have the best RTM depending on your land cover, right? So a forest RTM for forest, a more homogeneous RTM for grassland. So, so that was already one problem. And the other problem, none of these RTMs 10 years ago, they had actually uh, graphical user interfaces. So you needed to have some, some MATLAB skill or some programming skill in order to be able to work with it. So for us, it was actually the starting point to try to bring all these RTMs together within one um, software package and to standardize them so that you can very rapidly use one RTM or another. You can compare them. And you can see which one is best performing for your applications. So um, this was a little bit the starting point that we wanted to develop a graphical user interface toolbox that allows us to operate various RTMs within an intuitive interface. It allows easy visualization of the outputs. It can be used for both multispectral and hyperspectral data. And most importantly, we can use them for automated mapping approaches. And also, we wanted to take land cover class into account, so a combination of different RTMs depending on the land cover. So this is this uh, Artmo um, automated strategy transfer model operator. Tomorrow I will come here with my own laptop and I will just make you some examples so that you can see it works very quickly and you can do all kinds of simulations and automated mapping. But the idea is it's just plug and play. Uh, it should be very easy to use. Um, nowadays, we have quite robust version and it's generic for all kind of um, any kind of um, um, optical data, whether it's hyperspectral or whether it's satellite or airborne data. So these are the um, RTMs um, included. On one hand, we have the leaf models. Uh, we have um, the very simple ones. But also nowadays, we have leaf models for that take uh, fluorescence into account. Um, also, we have leaves for uh, classical leaves or for needle leaves models. Then the uh, canopy models. Also, we have um, for homogeneous area as well for forest area. Then we have the so-called combined models, uh, SCOPE, which takes um, fluorescence and everything into account. And um, so this actually was a basically the starting point. We, we thought, why don't we come up with apps? And uh, maybe nowadays uh, it changed, but back in 2010 or so, um, always when you were reading a paper and it looked very interesting, the method, but you never had the source code of it. Uh, you, I guess you all know this feeling, no? that it looks interesting, but you, you cannot use it because you have no access to the source code. Nowadays, it changed with, with heat and so on. But the idea was from all these interesting methods and RTMs to put it together as small apps within this um, um, Artmo framework. So this is um, uh, what we have nowadays. So we have the uh, leaf models, the canopy models, combined models. We have all kind of retrieval, uh, so mapping toolboxes. Um, so indices, machine learning, lookup table inversion. And we have all kind of tools. Um, so for doing um, output, uh, resampling, sensitivity analysis, emulation, scene generation, and so on. And uh, just a quick overview of the toolboxes. Basically, it, it's, as I showed before, it's very simple. So you have some satellite data. You, you choose your settings. Uh, you, do, um, you have some input data. You validate it. If you're happy with the validation, you apply it to an image, and that's it. And all of these toolboxes work in exactly the same way. So you can quickly compare the different methods and see how the output looks like. Um, also, so there are some tools for doing spectral resampling. So from one sensor settings towards another. So, so 
Um, emulation, I will talk later about it. Also, global sensitivity analysis that you can uh, calculate the importance of the input variables. So, for your spectral data, what actually is driving there? Is it chlorophyll? Is it LAI or so on? So, basically, this is a little bit what we have now. And um, in the uh, now latest version, also the atmosphere models are also included so that we can do the coupling from leaf to canopy to atmosphere. And if I would have my laptop now, I would open it and, and show a quick example, but we do that for tomorrow. So um, I'll, this is just a little bit of terminology. Um, we have um, inside our data storage, and um, it does project management so that you can rapidly um, um, make a new file or delete your simulations or so on. But what are the essential parts of the right differential models, the retrieval, so the mapping applications, and some tools? And um, maybe tomorrow I will show you just quickly how to do simulations for, let's say, changing chlorophyll, LAI, so for different kind of configurations. We very rapidly will do our simulations and we will see our outputs. So, so this is actually how it works, right? So we have our RTMs, so it can be a different scales, leaf, canopy, can be very complex. Uh, we, we, we configure it and we have our outputs. Output can be reflectance, transmittance, even fluorescence nowadays. And these outputs, then we can use into our mapping applications, right? So we use this as input, for instance, into our machine learning methods. And afterwards, we have our maps as output. It's that simple as it. It's just a few clicks. Uh, you define your settings, you train it, you validate it, and you, have, you have let it run over images. Um, OK, guys, so now um, it's a moment you can use your mobile if you want. And, um, you can um, click on this link, and uh, I want to give some options for the next coming days. So since I have too much material, um, you can vote yourself what you would like to learn more about for tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Maybe you want to learn about machine learning, maybe about indices. Um, so here is an overview of the topics I can cover for the next coming days, So which is simply running of these um, RTMs. So we do all kind of simulations at leaf scale, canopy scale, fluorescence, reflectance. Another one is that we go more into details about machine learning methods. Um, so we will use simulations, we train methods, and we apply it for mapping. Another option is that we learn about how to use all kinds of vegetation indices. Basically, we calculate all possible indices um, within our spectral data possible so that we have calculated these kind of triangles with all possible correlations. So and then, after, again, we apply the best performing one to our map. The following mapping option is the um, um, lookup table based inversion. So we have our um, simulations, a lookup table, we apply it against an image, and uh, we have also a map. And then finally, some extras. So this is, a, I want to can show you about global sensitivity analysis. So basically that we um, calculate the relative importance of the input variables for each RTM. So uh, chlorophyll content, where it is important in the spectral range, where water content is important, and so on. And finally, and maybe this is the most exciting for us nowadays, emulation. What is emulation? Basically, uh, some RTMs are so advanced and so complex nowadays that they take very long processing time. So we developed the technique how to overcome this, this long processing time by means of that we train our machine learning methods that it behaves exactly the same way as our original RTM. So basically, we train it, and it behaves the same. But once it's trained, it's super fast. So we can emulate our RTMs. We can emulate Motran or Scope or all these super advanced RTMs that normally takes hours or days or months even. Once you have the emulator, you have your output millions in order of seconds. So I can show you this, this technique. And finally, maybe a last option is um, to, uh, I can teach you about um, how to generate synthetic scenes. So again, our RTMs are as input. We generate some input maps, and then we let it run so that we generate scenes the way it should look like in reality. So here again, um, um, you can uh, go to this link and you can vote. Don't choose all of them because we will not have time for all of them. And I will teach then tomorrow the most popular topics. I think I will teach um, two topics for one hour, so tomorrow two, and then the day after tomorrow another two. And, and with this, I would like to uh, close my first lecture. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Yep. Hi, um, I've got a question about training data. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, probably one you've heard before, but it's kind of looking at the quantities of training data. Mm -hmm. How can you judge when you've got 
enough training data, too much kind of <laughs> those kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, so training data, that's always an issue. And, and actually, it's a very important question. But also, it depends on what kind of method you're using. And within the machine learning community, this is an ongoing, ongoing debate. And um, they are well aware that many of these super advanced methods, they do not cope well with very large amount of training data. I mean, if too much, um, then um, it takes ages. And maybe it's not even possible for, for your computer. So, um, uh, often there exists what they call sparse version of these methods, and these are then a little bit simplified so that it can be trained with a larger amount of data. Typically, um, like neural networks are very well able to train with large amount of data. So, so when you have many, many data, which is the case for us when we use simulated data, because we can simulate any kind of combination, then we uh, use these kind of neural networks. Now, when you have little uh, data available, maybe that's another problem that you just make use of field measurements. And then often the problem is that there's too few data available. So here um, um, we make use of um, well, what we call cross-validation methods so that if essentially um, the total amount of data is being used for training and validation so that you don't lose part of it because always you, your data typically split into the training part and validation part. So you often you use some part for validation. Um, so to, to try to overcome that by means of cross-validation methods. So I cannot give like an absolute number. It depends on the method and the application. But uh, for, for myself, uh, so when I use experimental data, field data for training, I use at least about 100 samples. Hmm. Any other questions? OK. Sorry. Um, do you think that, um, as you say, like the computational cost of doing more and more complicated methods is too large? Do you think that uh, as computers become more and more advanced with like, comp like quantum computing, do you think that mm. will be an issue in the future? Mm. No, you, you are very right. Actually, computational time is no longer an issue nowadays with, with this very advanced um, um, so computational issue is one part, and, and especially into this machine learning. Another part is the, also the um, size of the data, of the spectral data. So when there are too many bands, myself, I work for Flex, which has 400, 500 bands. So the data is extremely bulky. Not only that, but also there is this large um, redundancy in the spectral data. Actually, many bands, they provide exactly the same information. And, and that leads more to problems, so that the algorithms are not really able to cope with this large amount of redundancy. So, so therefore, um, to avoid this redundancy, but also to um, shrink down your data, I would recommend always to first apply dimensionality reduction methods before you do the training. So apply a PCA and use your training with the components of the PCA, and, and that, that will greatly simplify the, the problem. I guess there's always also the problem of um, overfitting. If you mm -hmm. have uh, if that you if you have too much training, then mm. the neural network fits too much your yes. training data and yeah. not other other data. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any other questions? Yep. Um, so uh, initially, my question was going to be how to choose the methods, but as you explained now, there are tools to do that. But how do you still say like if it gives you a result, and there are five methods output, mm. how do you say which one is the best? Mm. And is it based on what you expected mm. the result to be, mm. or how? Yeah, yeah. so th actually that's a good point, and I, I have my strong opinion about it. So, OK, so classically, we always do validation, right? We go into the field, and then we validate. But at the end, validation, uh, you can measure 20, 100 points. 100 points is nothing for a complete image that consists of millions of pixels, right? And also, this validation is typically for specific fields, but the image is much more than this image. So validation has to be done, absolutely. But I think validation is not enough. And that's why I, I strongly encourage to use methods that also provide uncertainties. So with uncertainties, you have on a per pixel basis, you know about the performance of the methods. And then you can simply say, um, OK, I only want to have these retrievals that are within 10 20% of uncertainty. 20% is typically accepted as, as the standard, as that's a good retrieval. So, so when you choose methods, personally, I would always go for methods that provide uncertainties. Tomorrow, we, we, I can show you. We can go more into detail about it. And uh, like when we want to compare studies that have used different methods, how easy or difficult is it? Or yeah, so, so also a good point. So when you want to compare your method of different size, also, again, um, when you have uh, uncertainties, you can see how the uncertainties are behaving on different sides. Uh, 
Are the uncertainties staying the same? Then you know your method is robust. Are the uncertainties going upwards? You know that your method actually works well in one place, but not really on another place. I, I was 